Hi everyone. Can you, can you hear me okay? My name is Petra McGowan and I'm the program manager for the Nature Conservancy's Reef Resilience Program and I'm going to be the host for the session today. This webinar is brought to you through the generous support of the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation and NOAA's Coral Reef Conservation Program. We're going to begin the webinar with presentations from our panelists and we'll end with questions from those participating. There's two ways you can ask questions during the webinar. First, you can use the question box at any time throughout the session and send questions and we'll keep track of them and I will ask them to the speakers at the end. Or you can raise your hand during the question portion of the webinar and I'll take your question during that time. You can raise your hand by clicking on the small hand icon to the left of the list of attendees. Also, if you're having any technical difficulties, like trouble hearing or seeing the slides, please send a question in the question box and let us know so we can try to resolve the issue. Before I introduce our presenters, I'd like to see who's calling in today for the call and give our presenters a little bit more information of who they're talking to. So can you fill out the poll and tell us what's the focus region of the work that you're doing in reefs? So I'm going to give you a second to fill this poll out. So I hope everybody's seen the poll. And so it looks like we've got a lot of Pacific Islanders. That's great. I was expecting that. And I'm glad to see some folks from some other regions. So thanks. We have um, one more question. How many of you are dealing with invasive algae in your work currently? All right. So Dwayne, it looks like you're going to have a lot to a lot of stuff to share because it looks like a lot of people are dealing with this so um, thanks everybody for filling out the poll and I'm gonna introduce our presenters and then they'll start so Dwayne Minton is a science advisor with the Nature Conservancy in Hawaii he has over 20 years of experience conducting applied science and management on Pacific coral reefs and he specializes in designing monitoring programs and analyzing data to examine the effectiveness of conservation actions. Lelani Warren is a marine fellow with the Nature Conservancy's Hawaii program. The fellowship is a two-year program designed to train emerging conservation professionals to use a wide range of marine stewardship skills and work directly with communities to manage their local nearshore marine resources. Lilani has been assisting the marine monitoring team with algae, coral, and fish surveys and several conservation action planning processes um, in Hawaii. So thanks, and I'll hand it over to Duane. Uh, hey, thanks, Petro. Um, can can, can you see on my screen the, the sort of webinar menu on the side because it popped up when the poll came up and I just want to make sure it's not still there for everyone looking at it. Okay, I'm, I'm assuming it's okay then. I'm not sure how nope, to get it. I exactly can't see your screen. screen right now. Um, yeah. Oh, you can't see my screen at all? Yeah, your screen's fine, Dwayne. I think you should. Okay, you're good. All right. Okay. Then, then I, I'll get started. Um, thank you very much, Petra, for, for having us. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here today. And um, I'd like to thank everyone for joining uh, Lay and me today. Uh, we're going to be talking about the benefits of an ongoing restoration in Hawaii. But before we get to the specifics of the project, Lay and I thought we'd take a few minutes to orient everyone to the project location. Uh, for those of you not familiar with Hawaii, it's an island archipelago in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. It's one of the most isolated island groups in the world and has high endemism both on the land and in the ocean. While its diversity is lower than the Western Pacific, including areas like the Coral Triangle, 25% of Hawaii's marine organisms are endemic, and the state is home to 80% of the U.S. coral reefs. The southernmost islands of the archipelago are populated, with the island of Oahu having nearly 1 million people. 
Most of these people live in the coastal zone and rely on nearshore coral reefs for income, food, property protection, and recreation. This high population density has resulted in numerous impacts to the island's nearshore reefs, and many communities around the state are concerned about the declining condition of their marine resources. Manalua Bay on Oahu's south shore is just one such community. Manalua Bay is heavily urbanized and is home to over 60,000 residents with diverse backgrounds and differing degrees of historical connection to the area. The infrastructure associated with this urban population has caused the loss of native upland and nearshore habitat. The proliferation of impervious surfaces has resulted in land-based pollution, including sediment and associated nutrients, washing onto the roofs, including the reef flat at the Pico area of Manawa Bay, which is the location of, uh, of the restoration project, which we'll be discussing today. But the region wasn't always like this. Historically, Manalua Bay was well known for its productive fisheries. A fishing cooperative locally called a Hui had established fishing rules that they felt were sustainable dating back to at least the 1930s. These included daily catch limits of 30 fish, 5 squid, 5 lobsters, and all the crab you could catch. Um, and these were allowable catches per day. These numbers are in stark contrast to the current condition. Um, a creel study conducted in 2009 found a fisher would be hard-pressed to get anywhere near these limits, as many of the prized species required over five hours of effort to catch a single individual. In the case of some of the species, such as jaffs, you'd be hard-pressed to catch a single individual even after a solid week of fishing. Even as recently as the 1980s, however, um, the Manalua Bay reef flats were still relatively intact and had extensive native ecosystems. They were noted for expansive meadows of Halafala Hawaiiana, an endemic seagrass, that is now um, considered a species at significant risk, and numerous native species of algae, including ova and alameda and gracilaria, uh, many of which were culturally and economically important food species. But this all changed in 1987 when a storm washed mud onto the reef, opening the door for the invasive algae Avernbae amadelpha, uh, better known as leather mudweed. Uh, this algae moved onto the reef flats of Manalua Bay, presumably from deeper water, and formed thick mats that excluded native species and displaced seagrass. These dense mats trapped sediment, and before long, uh, what you see in this picture uh, was a common sight in many areas of the bay. We can see in this aerial picture from 1988 a relatively clean reef flat in the project area, which is approximately encompassed by, by that red box. Much of the bottom in this area is, is white sand, uh, but we can still see a few dark stripes on the uh, reef flat, which are algae, uh, patches of algae. By 2005, uh, we can see that the reef flat has a lot more black on it, and much of that black was, was invasive mudweed. The declining condition of the reef flats con concerned community members, uh, many of whom had familial ties to the area extending back generations. With the support of the community, Dr. Kim Payton, a researcher at the University of Hawaii, began a small-scale uh, investigation to determine if the algae could be successfully moved from the reef flat. After several years, she saw little to no regrowth of mudweed in her one meter square plots. Inspired by this information, community members began to organize algae removal events, uh, locally called Lukis. During these community organized and led events, members of the general public, local businesses, and school groups began to manually remove mudweed over larger areas, um, generally on the order of about 10 by 10 um, meters. And gradually, uh, they started to make a visible impact, as you can see here. But this was hard and slow work, and the likelihood of this approach making a significant change baywide was unlikely. Uh, the community polls, however, were a critical first step in what would eventually develop into something called the Great Kuki, uh, which was a large-scale invasive alien algae removal and reef restoration project. This project was conceived through a collaboration of many different organizations and community members and received the bulk of its funding through the American Recovery and Investment Act, or, or stimulus money. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to Leigh to talk, about, to talk more about the project uh, and some of its restoration results. All right. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Okay. Um, so thank you, Dwayne. Um, aloha, everyone. Uh, I'm Leilani. And so as Dwayne mentioned, uh, the start of this uh, large-scale invasive algae removal project was the Great Cookie. Uh, and they established three goals at the start of the project. Uh, one, to create jobs. Two, to build community management and capacity in the bay. And three, to remove the dentist book of uh, Agrambalia amadelpha or Levin Levy. And uh, Dwayne is going to go ahead and talk about the first uh, two goals a little bit later. And I'm going to focus on goal three, which is the uh, removal process. Uh, 
So with uh, the money for the project, uh, a contractor, which was Kona Pacific Land Management Company, uh, was hired. And they hired a crew of about 50 full-time and part-time employees to uh, do the manual removal process. And if the crew was out in the water uh, about seven hours a day, five days a week, removing the algae by hand. And uh, about 10 meter by 10 meter pots would be marked off and um, the algae removed. The, we put into bags and either carried to the beach, as in this picture, or uh, floated by kayak. Um, and then those bags of algae would then be loaded into the truck. And um, once the truck was full there, it would be taken to local farmers who would then compost the algae and use it to uh, grow some of their crops such as this walla or sweet potato. Uh, so thankfully, it was uh, able to be used in a, a good way rather than um, you know, being of no use at all. Uh, to give you folks an idea of what the removal process looked like on the ground, um, this is kind of the, the stark contrast that we would see um, out on the reef flat. So on the left-hand side, you can still see the leather mud weed growing there. On the right-hand side, um, the area that was cleared, which is the sandy substrate, and you can see the water being able to now move through freely. Um, so one of the good things about uh, this process was that during the time that the Pono Pacific crew was, uh, in fact, removing, the community was still part of the effort, and they would uh, also be doing uh, uh, community cookies on the weekend. And for them, seeing the progress being made by the crew uh, really spurred them on and um, helped them con to continue their efforts and to have hope in the, the project as a whole. Um, so by the end of uh, about a one year time, uh, the Kona Pacific crew and the community uh, cleared uh, about 27 acres. and over 3 million pounds of invasive mudweed. Um, and the clearance was large enough to see from uh, aerial images. Um, so it's amazing to be able to look at uh, that picture as Dwayne showed beforehand with um, the, the dark brown throughout the reef flat um, to a, a you know, sandy mixed substrate of uh, uh, sand and, and uh, native algae. Uh, to the best of our knowledge at Nature Conservancy, we don't know of any other invasive algae removal conducted at this scale. Uh, so it's quite a unique project. But because nothing like it had ever been done, uh, there was um, you know, no real uh, idea if it would work. You know, would this large, clear area be able to recover back to a native ecosystem, or would the alien algae simply regrow, which was you know, what many people had thought. So this project provided an opportunity to not only remove an invasive habitat-altering species, but it was an opportunity to improve our scientific understanding of marine restoration in Hawaii, which was something that could potentially help you know, other communities and reefs across the island. Um, so in order to measure our success and you know, lasting results of removing the mudweed, uh, there were a couple of things that the Nature Conservancy science team, science team was interested in. Uh, so one was the response of the algal community post-removal. You know, would, would this native algae uh, grow back? Uh, number two, uh, what would be the fate of the sediment that was trapped by the root system of the leather mudweed? Would it you know, be flushed out, or would it continue to uh, maintain a presence on the reef flat? And lastly, what would be the recovery of the reef flat community as a whole? Uh, so in order to uh, answer some of these questions, um, monthly monitoring uh, was conducted uh, before, during, and after uh, the removal process. So just to give a quick idea of our, our monitoring effort, uh, every month, uh, since you know, uh, the project, uh, we would navigate to about 30 random points across the reef flat. 
and using a quadrat and point intercept method, we would survey the benthic community. So under each intercept, we would be identifying uh, uh, native algae or algae to the species as well as uh, the benthic substrate. And we would also be taking uh, depth measurements at each point. Um, but to kind of get at, you know, what the area looked like after removal, I just wanted to quickly uh, go into what did it look like beforehand. So prior to the project being done, uh, maybe to no one's surprise here, it was <laughs> characterized by uh, sediment, mud, and mud weed, as you can see in that uh, kind of deep footprint uh, picture in the bottom right corner. Um, and the Abrambalia amadolfo, or leather mud weed, made up about 58%, along with uh, two other invasive uh, algaes in the area, which would be the Acanthophora spitiferia and Brasilaria salicornia. Um, and so this, you know, these native uh, species, you know, pretty mightily outcompeted the natives for space. Uh, and they basically created uh, kind of a canopy structure. So uh, the 40% of native algae that was there present, uh, prior to the project was basically growing on top of all of the invasive algae, uh, which is very different from what a typical native Hawaiian reef flat would look like. So we're kind of left with the question, how uh, did removing the underlying layer of invasive algae affect the reef flat? And, and um, so after three years, this is uh, some of our data, uh, the changes in benthic cover, uh, it's pretty encouraging. Uh, so on the y-axis, we have the mean percent cover, and on the x-axis, we have months since clearing. And if we take a look at the uh, Abrambalia amadelpha, or um, the leather mudweed, which is the red, we can see that it started um, you know, prior to the project being at about 58%. And just right after starting the project, it had dropped to um, you know, just about 5% coverage and slowly has been pretty steady throughout, um, kind of having a gradual increase uh, to about 12% at about month 35. And that's similar to the other two invasive algaes uh, that are the navy and light blue uh, lines there. But then if we look at the native algae, the green line, starting at that 40% uh, cover, we can see that it also uh, took a significant drop, uh, being that it was sitting on top of all that uh, mud weed that was cleared out. That dropped to about 10% and um, kind of gradually became steady and uh, increased a little bit around month 20 to about the maybe 28-30% uh, coverage and then continued to have a gradual increase over time to the point where it's now at 50% cover which is higher than um, it was prior to doing anything. So that's uh, very encouraging. And you know, this gradual increase over time is, is likely due in part to the change in, in bottom condition. So if we take a quick look at the uh, bare substrate on this graph, which is the black line, starting at about 26% um, at the, the zero mark, uh, you know, significantly increasing as the project began, uh, and then slowly uh, becoming stable as well at about just under 60%. So, you know, we can see that the removal of this invasive algae opened up a lot of space uh, to really allow the uh, natives to be able to come back. Um, I want to also take a look at, um, you know, what the sediment was doing. Um, so uh, taking our sediment depth on the y-axis there and months after clearing on the x-axis, we can see that we started out the project at about, you know, three and a half centimeters of, of sediment, uh, dropping to you know a steady point of about 1.8 or so. So that's about a 50% decrease in the amount of sediment that uh, is on the reef flat there. So really providing some of that bare substrate for the natives to grow. Um, and we also had a uh, partner doing some uh, uh, sediment uh, sediment transport study. Um, so they found that mudweed was found to, you know, effectively trap all sediment, resulting in actual net accumulation. 
but following mud weed removal, the sediment flushing rate was estimated to be about four years for the fine sediment. Uh, they also found that there was no, now an average net loss of the fine sediment over the project area and that the removal of the mud weed had resulted in a flushing of the material, uh, leaving behind only the coarse marine sand. Uh, so, you know, that has been uh, an encouragement and really realizing that, you know, the sediment has not just stayed on the reef, but it's actually, actually being flushed out, uh, leaving, you know, the, the natural coarse sand. And now that we've, we've taken a look at some of those uh, individual components, just want to take a quick look at what's happening to the reef flat community as a whole. So using an ordination, we can look at the entire community. So this basically takes all of the sediment and benthic data and uses it to characterize the community of the project area. So we'll take our community at each month following clearance and plot it in the two-dimensional space. And where it falls in this space will tell us something about that community. So if it falls in the upper left as where the zero is, um, in the upper left corner, it's a community dominated by invasive species. And if it were to fall in the upper right, it would be in a native-dominated community. And if it were anywhere in the um, bottom region of the figure, it's a community dominated by the bare substrate. So if we start with that zero as where it should be in the uh, dominated by invasive algae, and then plot out um, each month um, monitoring, uh, we can see that uh, in months one through four, um, of post-removal, uh, that community is dominated by a bare substrate. And then maybe months 5 through 10, you can kind of gradually see that slight increase uh, kind of towards a, a native community. Uh, and then months 10 through 20, even gradually increasing a little bit more. But it's not until months 25 through 35 that we can really see that um, this uh, reef flat is recovering to be a community dominated by native algae. You know, and we can see that that's consistent with uh, our previous data uh, showing that that native algae is now at a higher percent cover than uh, was ever before. And I one last thing to take a look at. I just wanted to be able to show that, um, you know, not, not everything is completely rosy. Um, you know, the project has been successful beyond uh, many people's expectations, um, but we are seeing some mud weed growth in certain sections of the project area. So um, taking a look at this, we can see, um, you know, the red dots showing a different uh, percent cover of the Abervalia Amis Alpha. Um, the larger the, the dot, the, the larger the uh, percent cover. Um, so there does seem to be an increase in the northeast corner of the project uh, area. Um, however, the regrowth has been um, independent of bottom type as well as uh, pre and post clearance of the mudweed and of time of removal. So it doesn't really appear to be associated with the actual removal effort, uh, but may be linked to um, a storm drain that enters uh, right there where the yellow arrow is pointing. Uh, the storm drain does like produce a noticeable silt fan on the reef flat, which provides uh, that kind of perfect habitat for the leather mudweed to uh, to grow. So actually, fixing the drainage pipe has now become a priority for the local community. Um, but all of the data that that has been collected, you know, goes back to the community, and they can. Uh, now see where they need to focus their efforts. And with a, a modest amount of effort, they can maintain the area and continue to facilitate the growth of uh, the native community. And so just to kind of wrap up, just, you know, what does this all mean? I think it's, um, you know, that the restoration effort, you know, were in fact effective, that we were able to reduce the cover of the invasive algae to below 10%, and that, you know, with our monitoring, you know, three years post removal, that the native algae cover is higher than prior to removal. Um, that's a really encouraging, you know, information that you know these native communities can recover and begin to flourish. Um, so, with that, I will go ahead and uh, and hand it back over to Dwayne, and he's going to go ahead and talk about the uh, 
uh, non-ecological benefits and successes of the project. Thanks, Slay. Dwayne, we can't hear you if you're talking. Make sure you're not let's make sure you're not muted. Okay, there we go. Okay. Uh, All I right. assume now you can I hear me now. It tells me I'm yeah. unmuted. All right. Okay, hey, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, Leigh. Um, we're gonna switch gears now and uh, talk about other benefits accrued by this project. Um, ordinarily, when we think about benefits from restoration, we generally think of ecological, be uh, ecological benefits, uh, the return of native seagrass and algae in this case. Uh, but this is really a limited view, and it shortchanges the potential benefits that can be realized from this type of work. While the ecological benefits of the Mauna Loa Bay Restoration Project are many, and Leigh has already described several of them, we were also able to document numerous non-ecological benefits. Now, these non-ecological benefits tend to be the ones that directly involve people. Uh, these can include economic benefits, organizational benefits, and sociocultural benefits accrued either by the individual or the community. Um, now, I, I have to come clean here because I, I can't take credit for this specific work. Um, I, I'm a biologist and not an economist or sociologist. Um, so what I'll be talking about today is, is work that was led by uh, Dr. Jack Kittinger, who, who I think is um, in the audience today. Um, he's now at Stanford, um, and uh, we uh, hope that uh, some of the results from this work will be published soon in a special issue of Regional Environmental Change. Um, so keep your eyes open uh, for that paper. Now, a variety of intensive field methods were used for this work, including um, ethnographic research and interviews with community members, key respondents, and members of the various organizations involved in the restoration. The key respondents were identified using what's called the chain referral technique. Uh, which was used to identify people who were highly knowledgeable about the Manawila Bay fisheries, ecosystems, and the community. As such, this isn't intended to be a sample of the greater Manawila Bay community. It's, it's a sample of key stakeholders in the area. Um, I also want to note that this, this um, sample population shouldn't be viewed as people who were predisposed to agree with or be in favor of the project. Um, some of the individuals interviewed um, were um, initially neutral or, or possibly opposing uh, or possibly oppose the restoration project for a variety of reasons. Um, our sample population covered a wide range of age and educational level. Many of our interviewees had direct or familial ties to the area, some of which extended back generations. And many of the individuals we interviewed were also able to speak to the condition of the Bay um, five, six, or even seven decades ago because their first experience with Monolua Bay dated back as far as the 1950s in some cases. Over 20% of our respondents experienced Manalua Bay prior to the invasion of Leather Mudweed. Um, so they had direct personal um, knowledge of, of, of the conditions of the bay. This project was uh, originally fun well, this, this project was funded through the American Investment and Recovery Act, um, which was a large US federal government initiative to stimulate the economy and create jobs during the last economic downturn. The primary purpose of projects funded under this program was to create economic opportunities. Um, so that was one of the focuses of this work. 51% of our respondents received direct economic benefit from this restoration effort. And at least 97 positions were, were directly supported by funds from this project. Most of those positions were through Pono Pacific, the environmental restoration company that conducted the algal removal. Um, but other positions and other organizations also received significant support. Um, for example, my position at TNC was partially funded through this project. Um, and Lay was entirely funded as part of the Pono Pacific field team prior to joining TNC. Of these 97 positions, 63 proved to be endearing, ongoing positions, uh, and to the best of my knowledge, are, are still in existence today. Finally, we conservatively estimate that more than 250 individuals and 81 households um, benefited from funding uh, through the algal, algal removal crews at Pono Pacific. Um, that's just those crews alone, so um, that's uh, on the low end of people and households that, that benefited. These economic benefits extended beyond the people working directly on the restoration. The composted algae was distributed to local farmers and provided direct economic benefit uh, because farmers did not need to purchase additional soil, uh, soil supplements. One farmer estimated that he had saved 10% of his cost for soil amendments, which he estimated at hundreds of dollars a month. Another farmer cited similar savings and said he replaced conventional fertilizer with algal compost. 
We noted that an additional benefit was that the algae seemed to be promoting faster growth in its crops. Uh, and this was a benefit that was um, also supported by some scientific research using sweet potato um, that was conducted in, in parallel with, uh, with this restoration work. Now the faster growth would allow farmers to get crops to market more rapidly, uh, which in the long run would increase profits. Numerous organizations were involved in this project, but two in particular benefited from the restoration effort through an increase in their capacity. For the community organization Malama Monalua, increases in staff positions and operational functions were beneficial for leveraging additional funding and other support. Um, as a result of the restoration project, Malama Monalua was also able to develop and maintain relationships with more than 30 partner or organizations, including NGOs like TNC, schools, research institutions, clubs, businesses, and local, state, and federal governmental agencies. These partnerships increase their ability to implement programs focused on community building, mobilization, and education, allowing them to reach more people in more places. The environmental company Pono Pacific experienced dramatic growth, hiring approximately 75 people over the course of the restoration project. At any given time, 35 to 40 individuals were working on the project either on a part-time or a full-time basis. The scale and type of work undertaken led to the acquisition of new skills, including training, supporting and managing crews, and the development of expertise in communication and mitigation. According to one interviewee, this restoration enabled Pono Pacific to expand its capability and look for new projects. Today, the company has over 50 employees, uh, over a three-fold increase from prior to the Mono Mono Bay restoration. They have offices on three different islands in Hawaii, and manage numerous projects across the state. For Pono Pacific and its clients, this restoration project resulted in a skilled and knowledgeable workforce fueling the development of, of a local business dedicated to environmental issues. Numerous social benefits uh, or social cultural benefits were also found. Um, association with this project tended to promote physical and psychological health. For example, 80% of restoration crews felt their work improved physical condition and 96% of all respondents associated with the project reported personal gratification as a result of their restoration work. People felt good doing the work and achieved a considerable amount of pride in their accomplishments. We also noted several cultural benefits. Community elders called Kapuna and long-term local families described an increase in the transfer of intergener intergenerational knowledge. Um, so the, the older people in the community were um, transferring their knowledge of the, of the environment and the resources to the younger people in the community. And this is an important feature in Hawaiian culture. They also noticed a revitalization of the traditional Hawaiian cultural practice of ahupua'a stewardship, um, which most of us probably know better as watershed management. Additionally, uh, respondents noticed an increase in giving back of time and resources to the Bay, and a growing sense of responsibility for the stewardship of this place, which is known as kuleana in Hawaii. The respondents um, noted uh, uh, noted that awareness and the use of traditional names, including Mauna Loa itself, had increased as a result of this restoration effort. And finally, this project seemed to increase awareness about other cultural restoration projects in the area, including restorations of a nearby fish pond and historical Hawaiian temples. Respondents also identified several benefits to um, ocean recreation users. Generally, these recreational users of the bay had a positive impression of the project. They noted clearer water and a change in the bottom from sand to silt. Surfers liked the sand because it made access to surf sites easier, um, but they also noted that this had a negative impact of increasing crowding at some sites. Um, so surf, there was some crowding, but that also represents an increase in people using and enjoying the environment. Fishers also noted an increase in water clarity, and the more tenured fishers with a longer history of experience in the bay remarked that the conditions at the site following restoration reminded them of how the bay looked decades ago. In addition, 85% of uh, fishers reported seeing more bonefish in the area following restoration, and 40% said they were catching more fish. Among individuals, the place-based, hands-on nature of this restoration project resulted in an enhancement of environmental awareness. We noted an increase in the individual sense of responsibility for stewardship or kuleana and an increase in the desire to care for the land and sea, both among our respondents and within the greater Mauna Loa Bay community. Telephone surveys conducted before and after the restoration project showed an increase in the general public's awareness of the impacts of invasive algae. Community volunteerism steadily increased during the course of this project and after the project concluded. 
in 2012, the year the restoration project ended, over 1,500 volunteers donated 4,300 hours of their time to conducting stewardship projects in the Mauna Loa Bay watersheds. Since January of this year, those numbers have increased to over 3,000 volunteers donating over 7,500 hours. This project was a proof of concept for a restoration approach that had never been tried before at a large scale, and it produced visible and startling restoration benefits for the nearshore reef. But the tangible benefits of this project extended beyond the biological and included economic, organizational, and sociocultural benefits. This proved to be a rallying point for the community, which continues to mobilize several hundreds of volunteers a month in an effort to maintain and further enhance the biological gains. Um, as a direct result of this project, the environmental contractor, Pono Pacific, was able to expand its capacity and expertise and now operates across the state conducting ecological restoration work. But perhaps the strongest benefit has been a reconnection of the community with the natural resources of the watershed and a reinvigoration of the Hawaiian concept of kuleana with a sense of responsibility and respect for a place. This kuleana will be critical for the future success of, of this specific project, but more importantly, has mobilized the community to begin to tackle other more contentious issues um, that are threatening the bay, um, things such as overfishing or, or non-point source pollution. While this project benefited by being well-funded, um, its success and many of its benefits started well before any grant money arrived. The benefits Lay and I discussed today are, are not exclusive to this particular restoration effort. Um, and in fact, any project, large or small, can accrue similar benefits. So to close out, um, I wanted to highlight a few things that Lay and I uh, think were important to the success of this restoration, um, and which can apply generally to other restoration efforts. Um, first, dream big. Um, this project started with a few community members, and then a few more, and a few more, and eventually became uh, one of the largest marine algae removal projects in the world. Um, and, and quite possibly the largest uh, marine algae, uh, invasive marine algae removal pro uh, project. Um, it got to that point through collaboration and continuous effort on the part of many people and organizations. Also, um, it's important to monitor successes and to highlight them to show stakeholders results and to inspire them. By doing this, you can empower the community to even greater lengths and greater heights. Um, I think it's important to note that um, scale doesn't make success. Uh, it's the people involved in the project that do. Um, with that, um, I'd like to leave you with a closing statement from one of the Monterey Bay community members uh, who summed up what this work has meant uh, to the greater community. Um, and uh, at that point, I guess Lay and I will be happy to take questions. Great. Well, thanks to Wayne and Lay for those presentations. We are going to take questions right now, so if you have a question, please raise your hand and we will call on you. Um, and I have one right now. So first of all, Dwayne, what was the total cost of the project? This is from Rob O'Connor at NOAA Fisheries. Oh, geez. <laughs> I don't remember the exact number off the top of my head. Um, I, if I remember correctly, it was about $3.5 million. Um, so there was a large cost in this project. Um, do, you, do you happen to have that, the number right there, Leigh? I, I should have had that number handy. I apologize. I don't. Yeah, it, it, it was approximately three and a half million, I think. All right. Um, another question from Islam El Sadek is, with the algae removal, Leigh, this was during your portion of the presentation, what were the effects, if you guys monitored the effects on the benthic fauna that was in existence there with that kind of removal that you guys did? Um, well, I, you know, I actually uh, was working on the Puno Pacific Coast <laughs> during, yeah, during the time of the removal, so Dwayne would know a little bit more about, you know, pre-removal and, and during the project, so I'll hand it off. All right. Great. Um, yeah, yeah we, we actually had a, a, um, a partner take a look at, at some of the other um, changes in some of the other uh, benthic organisms. Um, we, we had someone looking at um, infaunal stuff, so you know, all the little worms and stomatopods and stuff living down in the sand. Um, and, and, and what they found actually was that there was a similar complement of, of infaunal species in the invasive um, in that invasive algae community as there was in the native algae community. Um, there were a couple of small differences, um, but there wasn't a significant change. Uh, well, there, there was a drop in what was there initially because they ripped everything out, 
uh, and there was a gradual recovery um, of, of that informal community. Um, that project ran for about a year, um, and the recovery of the community was not complete at that point. Um, one of the things about, about this restoration project that really surprised me, and I, I think some other people, was um, just how long some of these communities took to recover. Um, a lot of times people talk about how quickly you know, in faunal communities, you know, that stuff living in the sand, and, and algae communities, oh, they recover really quickly. Um, we were finding that, that they don't. Um, you know, more than a year had gone by, and, and some of those in faunal communities had not fully recovered. Uh, and the algae community um, took close to three years uh, to really see good, good recovery. Okay, thanks, Dwayne. Um, we have another question. Has this project generated funding or more, more momentum to clear the remaining algae in the reef flats that exist in Mauna Loa Bay? Because I know it's a big bay. And, or is more funding being pursued to continue the project? Um, yeah, I mean, I uh, go ahead and take it, it has definitely generated. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Uh, sure, go ahead. Uh, go ahead, Lake. Oh, I was going to say, um, as far as, uh, you know, building the capacity for Malama Mount um, you know, they uh, have been able to get other sources of funding, um, you know, because of the success of the um, large-scale removal. Um, I know that they did go for one other kind of large grant, but, but weren't able to get that. But as far as, yeah, showing that, you know, this algae can be uh, removed and that it, you know, takes a long enough time to go back has allowed them to get other sources of, of funding and really leverage uh, what they can do. So they continue to do uh, community cookies at about uh, five or six different sites across the whole day. Um, and they have actually um, upped their, um, their amount of cookies to about three per month, I believe. So they're still out there and they're still, um, you know, removing algae, but they're also using uh, their time in the, the Bay as education, so they work with a lot of school groups as well to, to make it kind of an outdoor uh, learning. Um, this, uh, this project's also um, benefited, I think, uh, other areas. Um, people outside of Mauna Lua uh, became very uh, much aware of this project as it was going on. Um, and it increased a lot of awareness of, of the problem of invasive algae, um, in particular on Oahu, uh, and has, has helped with some other efforts. Um, for example, um, there's now a large clearing effort going on up in Kaneohe Bay, which is a, another embayment, but on, on the other side of Oahu. Um, and TNC is, is involved in that area. It's called the Kaneohe Bay Initiative. Uh, and we're doing a very large scale um, invasive algae removal up there. Um, the, the folks in Manalua Bay have, have continued to um, actively clear, uh, and they continue to seek other funding. And as Leigh had said, um, it sounds like they, they did land a couple of small smaller grants to keep doing some of the work. Um, but they, they've also used this project to, to springboard into um, to try and address other issues. Uh, they, they recently had, uh, Malama Manalua recently had a, a, an EPA grant um, to, to do some work with uh, sediment runoff. Uh, and I know that they're um, looking for ways now that we've identified the, the storm drain to actually deal with the, that, that storm drain that is um, dumping more silt onto the reef and, and maybe um, allowing some of the mudweed to reestablish itself in the project area. Okay, thanks, Dwayne. Um, I'm going to call on Bose Hancock right now. I think he has a comment question he'd like to share. Bose, you there? I am. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, yeah, it was really just a, a comment more than anything. Looking at your results, Dwayne, it did strike me that it took two years of monitoring to really start to see um, the situation stabilize back to what you would be hoping to, to see after the restoration. So it's a comment on the importance of building in a slightly longer term um, monitoring program, something we always have difficulty with. Uh, but something I like to highlight when the results are as obvious as yours. Yeah, yeah thank, um, th thanks for that comment, Bose. That's, I think, really, um, it, it's really important. Uh, I mean, 
we oftentimes don't want to fund monitoring or granting agencies don't want to fund monitoring and um, I think it's really important because we may not begin to see some of those effects until quite a ways out. Um, and it's that monitoring that, especially in this case, fed back into the community because as they began to see positive results, they began to get more excited um, and more motivated to actually go and, and, and do things. Um, I think that's one of the reasons you see their volunteerism is, is going up and up and up and up because they're, they're able to show positive results. Um, so, so yeah, um, that's, I think it's very, very key uh, and important to do. Okay, thanks. Um, I have another question. I'm not sure who wants to take it, but could you speak to how this project relates to other invasive algae removal projects, like the one using the super sucker or uh, hand removal on the windward side of Oahu, I think um, the person means. Um, are, you, are any best practices emerging, and um, how do these different projects inform each other? Um, this question is from Charlie Quinn. Ooh, that's that's a good question. I'll I'll try and tackle this one. Um, how are the projects um, related? Well, I mean, there's the obvious. They're they're both attempting to address um, a, you know sort of a similar threat. Um, they are both working in in very different systems. The Mauna Loa Bay project was a was a reef flat project in very shallow water, um, whereas uh, the algae clearance going on up in Kaneohe Bay. Uh, is being done in uh, slightly deeper water and is being done on patch roofs uh, using um, a, a mechanical, basically a big algae vacuum, um, which um, TNC and some partners developed uh, quite a while ago to, to deal with invasive algae. Um, these, these projects kind of have a synergistic effect, I think. Um, the Mauna Loa Bay, the, the Super Sucker has been around for a while and has gotten a lot of um, uh, you know, a lot of press, and a lot of people were aware of it. And I think some of the successes from the from the Super Sucker project um, helped the Mauna Loa Bay project um, get some recognition and, and secure some of the funding. Um, at least that's the impression I get. Um, and then the Mauna Loa Bay project, at least the successes of that project, I think have really um, increased some of the awareness within the uh, greater island-wide community on Oahu. Uh, and and has allowed us to to, to really push forward um, uh, other alien algae removal projects such as the Kaneohe Bay one. Um, and our our sort of Kaneohe Bay initiative at this point is uh, is is well along in meeting its goals for for funding and for work. Um, and and so I think that that speaks to um, an increased awareness among the public and and a, a desire and a willingness to um, step up and and help. Um, also with that project up in Kaneohe Bay, we're, we're beginning to see volunteer groups who want to participate, want to come out and be involved. Um, and so we're beginning to see some of these other non-ecological benefits that, that I was talking about with Mauna Loa Bay one. Um, you know, people are beginning to feel that sense of ownership and desire to be out there. So um, while there are many differences in these projects, I think that, uh, that there is sort of this uh, relationship and this uh, synergistic effect that, that's gone on with them. And um, hopefully with with continued successes both down in Manolo Bay and also up in Kaneohe Bay, uh, we can use those to continue to springboard and um, really try to address a very significant um, problem on, on reef flats uh, in Hawaii. Okay, thanks Duane. Um, another question on the transferability of the project. Um, is, it, is it necessary to have these kind of large, huge slugs of funding for invasive algae removal, or do you think it can be successful with smaller starting startup funds? Um, can you talk about that a little bit? Um, sure. Uh, I don't, I think it depends on, on the project uh, and, and the scale that, that you're hoping to achieve. Um, I don't think you need, you know, a multi-million dollar slug of money um, to uh, conduct an invasive algae removal project and, and to see um, benefits. Um, the local community was, was working in a, in a small area in Mauna Bay, um, and they were gradually achieving benefits. Um, in order to achieve the level of benefit that they wanted, 
um, they needed to needed to dream big. Um, and this project uh, got a slug of money in it, uh, which allowed them to um, basically take a huge leap forward. Um, I'm fairly convinced that the community, even if this money hadn't come through, uh, would have continued their clearance efforts, would have continued to you know, gradually draw more people into the project, uh, and would have and would have more slowly showed showed some of these results. Um, there are you know a lot of factors which I think need to be considered um, when, when you start working on a project like this. Um, the size of the area that needs to be cleared, how that how that algae needs to be cleared. Sometimes it needs to be a hand removal. Sometimes there are mechanical ways to get at it, um, like with the super sucker. Um, and all of those would affect how, how much money is actually needed, how much time is needed, and, and, and so forth. OK. Thanks, Dwayne. Um, another question, I'm not sure who wants to take this one, but it is, did you notice any fish moving back into the area um, post-removal? Lay would be great for this one. <laughs> um, so, I mean, just observationally, I think we definitely were able to see um, different fish coming back if, when we started the project. So, um, I, you know, was able to, to work on the project as part of the Point of the crew. So, throughout um, the whole process, we really didn't see, you know, much fish at all. Um, you know, there were uh, some OEO or bone fish fishermen that were, you know, at the site. Um, we didn't really see them catching much. Uh, but towards the end of the project, we began to see um, to see more fish. We actually a couple times took our um, took a snorkel and mask to just kind of check out it on some of the higher tide days, and we're actually able to see uh, some different schools of fish coming back into the area. Um, and now, since we've been uh, monitoring the area with the Nature Conservancy, um, we've been able to see small schools of, uh, of mullet on the shoreline, as well as um, some uh, cockroach or barracuda, uh, small barracudas in the area. Um, and then, as, as Dwayne said um, during his presentation, you know, there has been indication from the you know tenured fishermen that there, um, you know, have been an increase in, in the fish, and that even some will say that they are catching more fish as a result. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's definitely uh, not something that we've been, you know, quantitatively monitoring, but uh, something that we've been able to, to see and that some of the residents are seeing. Thanks, Blay. OK. Um, we have another question specifically about any lessons learned or mistakes that were made that should not be repeated in this kind of project. Getting right at some tough questions. <laughs> ah, boy, that, that that is a tough that is a tough question. Um, I, I was I was incredibly surprised at at how smoothly um, this project went on, on many fronts. Um, uh, I unfortunately wasn't involved with the project during the, the very early phases of it, so um, so I can't speak too much about uh, some mistakes that may have been made, I guess, in the initial um, sort of phases of, of getting it set up. Um, and, yeah, I, I mean, I, I can't think of too much off the top of my head in terms of, of outright mistakes that might be really good lessons learned. Um, it, you know, the... The, the collaboration, I think, on this project was, was really strong. Um, there were a lot of good people working on this project. Um, and there were a lot of partners on this project, um, everyone from scientists to, um, uh, to, to community members to managers to um, you know, governmental agency people. Um, I, I would say that, that it was the involvement of all those people that, that probably stopped us from making a lot of a lot of big mistakes on this project. Um, do you, did anything jump out at you, Lay? Um, I mean, I wouldn't really necessarily, not really by any means a mistake, but I, I did want to point out just the, the um, really the role of you know adaptive uh, management on the job. I think when we were doing the clearing we began clearing in a certain way where we were, you know, clearing large 
squares of algae, but we were leaving these kind of um, columns of algae that would extend from the shoreline out uh, toward the reef. And initially, uh, everyone was thinking that this would kind of allow the flushing of the sediment, you know, to kind of just, it would create these corridors where the sediment would be flushed out. However, um, you know, some of the sediment studies that were happening uh, were able to show that, oh, you know, the sediment actually doesn't flush that way. Um, so with that information, we were able to change the way we were pulling, and we ended up just, you know, taking out those large columns that we had left, and that was able to create um, a much better um, flow that the current would be able to take that sediment out off of the reef flat. Um, so it was really, you know, sort of somewhat of a, you know, a mistake or error in, in the way we, we began our pulling process. But with the help of, you know, really using the, the data that was available, um, changing the way the whole project was going was gonna to go. So it was really an adaptive way to work. So I think we're going to wrap up because we're out of time, but I wanted to thank everybody for joining us and thank you to our presenters for the great honor of sharing your work in Hawaii and the lessons learned from this project. Um, the recording of this webinar as well as the resource links are going to be sent out through our email um, network list after today. And if you're not on the list and would like to be, please email us at resilience at tnc.org. Also, we're always open to suggestions for future webinar topics, and you can send those to the same email. Um, please tune in to our next webinar on November 6th with Dr. Jeffrey Maynard and Steve McKagan. And they'll, they'll be presenting on the new assessment of resilience in all reef sites in Saipan. See you in the live. So again, thanks to Dwayne and Leigh for the presentation, and thanks to all of you for participating. It was great to have you. Thank you.